Good morning, friends. In Matthew chapter 7, our Lord tells the people, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. And this passage relates to Sunday's message because in that message, we experience some of the narrowness and the difficulty of the path that leads to life. We saw how the path we walk, the one that follows the course of truth, can actually easily be missed. It's easy to step off that path and get lost in the wilderness on either side of that narrow path. And we saw this play out even as we considered the final statements of our Lord's Olivet Discourse, where he explains what seems to be the deciding factor of why some people enter into the full and eternal kingdom of God on the Day of Judgment, while others enter into eternal punishment. And because if we just do a cursory reading of Christ's teaching in this case, if we're not really paying attention, it is easy to step off the narrow path into the wilderness of a false gospel of works. Because once again, it appears at that surface level that Jesus is saying, if you do these things, if you love one another in all these various ways, then on account of your doing them, you will be saved. You will then have the right to enter the kingdom of God because of what you did. And that leads to a very dangerous mindset of, okay, I've got to do better. I've got to make sure that I am doing all of these things because then I get to go to heaven because I've done all these things. And even if you've never used the word earn in your own thinking or, you know, you know that you would never explain it to anyone else as ter- in terms of earning it, um, that is what is happening. If you say or think, I must do these things because then God will accept me, you are saying that by your own actions, by your own efforts, by your own deeds, you are earning salvation. And that is, of course, a false gospel, and it actually condemns the person who embraces it rather than saves them. Now, the wilderness on the other side of the path that we must also avoid is the illegitimate notion of antinomianism. Now, forgive me, sometimes I just need to throw a word like that out there because, as you know, I love words. I love big words. I love explaining what words mean. And this happens to be a really good word to know, antinomianism or antinomian, because the prefix anti means against or in place of. We're familiar with that one. You know, for instance, a a, a really big one in in Christian lingo is the antichrist, right? The antichrist is one who is against Christ, also one who tries to take the place of Christ, antichrist. Um, So we know what anti means. Uh, The root word of nomian or nomianism, uh, however, you might not know, and that's the Greek word namos, which refers to law. So an antinomian person is a person who is against the law and who in a very real sense tries to replace the law with themselves. In other words, they reject the law of God and replace it with their own standard. And antinomianism can actually get a lot of traction within Christian circles because we start with the premise that we are not saved by following the law, we are saved by grace, which of course is true. But the antinomian will take that truth and then go way, way too far with it. They will misappropriate and improperly apply Paul's teachings when he says we are not under law but under grace. Because then they will say uh, that the law of God uh, no longer has anything to do with us, that we can toss it out. It's irrelevant. It served its purpose once upon a time, but no more. And once again, they will defend this position by saying, hey, we're saved by God's grace, not by following the law. And here's the thing about both of these areas of wilderness on either side of the actual path we need to walk. Um about both of these positions because it shows just how narrow the path is that we need to walk in Christ because both positions hold an element of truth. It's just that those elements of truth are basically eradicated. Uh, The truthfulness of the statement is eradicated by all the falsehoods that are heaped up on them so that we cannot actually uh, accept those 
either of the positions, even though there is that element of truth. Because here's here's the deal. Going back to that false gospel where think that people think they must do certain things to earn salvation. The element of truth there is that in order for a person to be saved, some things do have to happen. That part is true. And in fact, they themselves must do certain things. After all, there is no getting around the fact that at the close of Matthew 25, Jesus says that the sheep, okay, the those that he calls the righteous, are invited into the kingdom of God because they love the people of God. There's no getting around that. And then on the opposite side, the goats are excluded from the kingdom and sent into punishment because they did not love the people of God. So there's a very real sense in which for a person to truly be saved, they do need to love God the people of God. They need to love Christ's brothers. Okay? But where that false gospel of works becomes a false gospel is in the idea that that person would then love the people of God in their own power, by their own ability. Because yes, it must happen. But how does it happen? Answer, by God's grace. He is the one who is love. He is the one that love comes from. He is the one who is perfecting his love in us. And so, yes, we need to love God's people, Christ's adopted brothers and sisters. But how are we actually going to do that? Only by God's grace working in us and through us. Because ultimately, it is Christ himself who loved his brothers perfectly. And if we are in Christ, then most importantly, it is his perfect love that is ultimately credited to our account before the Father, but also as it pertains to everything we're talking about uh, for the day of judgment, it is his perfect love that eventually works its way out in us as the fruit we bear. And so yes, the loving must be done. Christ's command to love one another as he has loved us must be obeyed. But it is only by the grace of God through faith and reliance upon Christ who then works that love in us and through us that it happens. And so I say again, the part that's true is that yes, certain things, certain works, certain fruit must be produced. Or perhaps a better way to put it is that certain things, certain works, certain fruits will be produced if a person is genuinely saved. Because if they are genuinely saved, then through faith in Christ, they are therefore rooted in Christ. And anyone who is being nourished by Christ will, of course, produce the fruit that naturally comes from that nourishment. So therefore, the things will be done. The fruit will be produced. But it's not a gospel of works because the one doing those things, the, the works producing the fruit in us is God. And he applies those things and does them in us according to his grace. And for our part, yes, we are responding to what God does in us and through us. We are, in a sense, I don't, I don't like this word. I, I, I want to get a better word, but for lack of a better word, in a sense, we are cooperating in being used by him in those ways. But it really is entirely God's work that does it. And we are reliant on that fact, not our own ability, but on God's gracious uh, work in us. And, and then we have the converse being true on the other side of things. We reject that, the other notion of antinomianism. We reject it completely. Uh, we understand that it's not legitimate to say, oh, it's by God's grace. Therefore, I don't have to worry about obedience to any particular law whatsoever. No, we know that it is false because even though we are saved by grace, as we've just seen, God's grace itself leads us to produce the fruit of obedience. Now, the part of this that is true is that we are saved by God's grace. And therefore, we have it reinforced that even though obedience is going to be part of the Christian life, we are not saved by that obedience, um, especially because we know that we do not obey God perfectly. And we won't obey God perfectly until we are completely transformed and glorified in eternity in his presence. So we reject antinomianism because we do seek to obey God now as a result of the grace he has applied to us. 
And if we think about it, our greatest hope is in being glorified so that we can be rid of our sin and then obey him perfectly for all eternity. So if that's the goal, how much sense does it, to, does it make to say now, uh, don't worry about obedience now, it's not that important. How can we say that when obedience, perfect obedience, is one of the blessings that we're going to joyfully experience for all the rest of the everlasting ages in God's presence? It makes no sense to reject the law and reject the idea of wanting to obey God now if that's what we're going to be doing for all eternity. But the part that does make sense is that we are indeed saved not by any measure of our obedience, anything that we do on our part, but by the grace of God. We should strive in faith and reliance upon Christ to be obedient now because that is in keeping with what it means to be a child of God. But when we fail, when we sin, and the Apostle John tells us that we do have sin, and if we deny that fact, then the truth is not in us. Okay, so when we sin, even when we sin uh, grievously, we do not need to immediately assume that all is lost, that our sin has moved us from life back to death. No, because we are indeed saved by the grace of God alone. So, my friends, hopefully this helps illustrate how narrow the road is that we walk between legalism and lawlessness, that we recognize the role of God's grace in our salvation, but also that having received that grace, we are then motivated in that grace because of his grace to obey him. And how that obedience, prop, again, properly motivated, not an obedience that is motivated by a desire to earn salvation, but a but, but uh, obedience that is motivated by a simple desire to please the one who's already granted us salvation, how that sort of obedience becomes necessary evidence that a person is saved by the grace of God. A lot to think about. I hope it's helpful. I love you guys. I pray you have a good and godly day. And Lord willing, I'll see you soon.